morning, everybody. I don't try it again, you know, to hear how loud can you talk. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here. It's my pleasure, it's my honor, you know, to be keynote speaker. Actually, I'm a bit nervous, I need to say as well. You know, this is when you're standing here in front, you know, all of you professionals. I'm sure that you will judge what I'm going to say afterwards. You know, I will say, yeah, I'm not sure what you said there, but let's try it. So I want to talk first briefly about HP. Let me see if Technic is working. Um, you mentioned it, right? HP, you all know, I hope at least. You know, usually people are saying, oh, you do the printers. Yeah, we also do the PCs. But we, just three years ago, we were spinning off the company into different pieces. So there is a piece of the company which is called Hewlett Packard Enterprise, more focusing on servers. And this piece of the company where I belong to, we just call ourselves HP. And we took the brand with us, if you want. At the end, what you can see here, we are successful in PCs. We are successful in printing. Um, and over the last three years, we did grow revenues where everybody was saying, oh, you guys, you know, just with printers declining, PCs declining, I cannot believe that you will make um, a strong momentum. This is the revenues in fiscal year 18. We just are closing the books as we speak nearly have closed the books. That's the reason why I can stand here. As you know, supply chain, you don't need to deliver and whatever kind of stuff. Last week was our last days of the fiscal year. So very soon you will see the revenues um, announced for fiscal year 18. And so far it looks good that the next number is higher. So when talking about <coughs> HP, also want to briefly talk about our products. And a lot of the stuff you know. And the reason why I show it, because you can imagine what does it mean to have to run a supply chain for these kind of products. So you know usually the printing piece, you know, because hopefully at home you have an HP printer as well as in the office, so we have also bigger machines. I will talk about that machine a bit later, because now that's not a typical printer, because it's not on two dimensions, right? So but I will come to this a bit later. We also went into the um, area where the younger generation plays. So we have a sprocket, a very small mobile printer, which is connecting to your smartphone and where you get photos out. Um, people who know Polaroid from the past or whatever, you know, this is the more modern version of it if you want, and the young generation loves it. On the other side, you see a lot of PCs. Um, you know, also there is something which has to do with immersive um, computing, but what you can see, you know, is a range of product which you all know. Now, you say, this guy is talking about supply chain, what does it mean? At the end, in order to do this, we are operating a quite complex supply chain. These are just our manufacturing nodes. And you can see a lot in Asia, but we are also distributed um, around the world. And in order to then make sure that your products come to the customers, you need to operate a network. Some of the people here are part of our suppliers, you know, running some logistic activities. Um, and I don't want to moan or claim, you know, that this is more complex than what you guys are doing, but just one number I want to share with you. Every minute, we are delivering to our customers 106 PCs. Every minute, every hour, every day around the year. So if you want to compute every second, 1.7 PCs. For sure, my goal is that it should be two. But uh, you know, that shows you the magnitude and the size and the scale of our supply chain. 67 printers, and yes, you know, using toner cartridges and ink cartridges, we have a lot installed base. I hope a lot of you have our printers installed. Hence, you know, we are also shipping a lot of supplies every minute. So we needed to build a supply chain which is agile, which is fast, which is able to drive this volume. <clears throat> and I think we did this quite successful because those volumes, you know, did increase. The PC volume did increase over the past years by a 10 to 15 percent every year. So you need an agile supply chain. <clears throat> like the, at the beginning, it was said, you know, a lot of turbulences, a lot of changes are coming. We, as an American company, you know, are facing some very, very big things, you know, which we here in Europe do not care so much about. But the tariffs which Mr. Trump, Mr. President Trump has introduced, you know, um, is creating us a lot of headache. And me, we are moving some manufacturing from China into the US and all these kind of things. That will be not part of my presentation, but what I wanted to say, on the one hand side, you have scale. And you need to be fast to adapt to changes. And on the other side, you know, um, a lot of things are happening in the world. And we were just talking earlier this morning about what do we do for Brexit. But that's a discussion for tomorrow for all of you. But for sure, every company needs to make sure that we stay agile on it. So <clears throat> the result of our supply chain activities, you know, is measured by Gartner, as you all know. <clears throat> and what you find there is somewhere HP is showing up, you know, in the top 25. 
in the past, we were also um, part of this ranking still as a combined company with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, but this is now standalone. And you see a lot of companies, you know, on here, um, and we are very proud, you know, to be number 14 in the world's um, supply chain. Now, our goal, obviously, is, you know, to become under the, in the rank of the first 10. Um, but for us, it's very important, the innovation which we are driving, that we also share this with people, um, and it's valued somehow. You do not find our direct competition on this chart. Right? So there is no Dell and Lenovo on the top 25, or a Canon or a Xerox, so, which makes me very happy to say we are doing something right in HP on the supply chain. So... While we have all these kind of um, activities around us and changes in the world, you know, we have decided to also change the supply chain dramatically. I think the left hand, you, or from your end, the left side, you know, you see a typical supply chain, how it's working. Um, you have your production, your distribution, you need to deliver to customers. And when, when we looked into it, you know, you're looking into data, you're looking into silos, here are the guys who do the planning, here are the guys who do the production, here are the guys who do the logistics, but somehow it didn't feel right. It wasn't really connected, but you know, you can drive a supply chain like this. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, what we are thinking about and what we want to um, change is, you know, we want to have the supply chain more seen as a digital value chain. I'm not even talking about a supply chain anymore because what we, where we want to drive, and I give you some concrete example afterwards, where we want to head for is that this is more an ecosystem, you know, where you know, data you know, is going from one step to another. Supply chain is in the middle coordinating these kind of things um, where at the end you, know, you can work with data differently than before. If we talk about analytics, if we talk about artificial intelligence or whatever kind of thing, but it's more important, you know, that you are able to connect between those kind of activities to drive really value for the company. Now you will say, oh my goodness, this is one of these boring presentations, you know, where the guys are just showing concepts or whatever, but there's no real work behind. So this morning I will show you two examples where I believe is really a proof point. You know, if you change a bit the thinking model, supply chain acting differently, you can also change more than just optimizing your supply chain. And the two examples I want to give today is about Instant Ink and 3D printing. So let me start with Instant Ink. Like I said before, you know, a lot of you have a printer. And I think, you know, going to a shop and buy a new cartridge is something, you know, which is a must but somehow it's also something like a pain, right? Because, oh, I'm running out of ink, but I need to print, uh, so why is this not easier to be done? So we have invented something like, you could call it a subscription model or an automatic replenishment or whatever. So if you buy a printer where this system is working on and sign up, you can sign up for a subscription fee. So you can say, I'm printing a lot, I'm printing medium, and I print only small numbers. Um, and at the end, you pay a monthly fee and you don't need to do anything more for the rest of your lifetime of your printer or even beyond. Because HP is going to deliver the ink cartridges to your door when it is needed. So you will not even need to order something or whatever kind of thing, it goes automatically. Um, the printer is telling us at which point of time he's running empty, and at the end, you know, this makes sure that automatically cartridges are coming to your home when you need it. You don't care because you don't need to buy these cartridges. The cartridges are owned by HP if you want, right? We give it to you, we send it to you, you just have the monthly fee. So what does this have to do with supply chain and why is this something new, something special? When you think about, you know, what does supply chain need to do? First of all, you know, you need to have these devices connected to the internet, obviously, right? The buzzword usually is Internet of Things, right? So these kind of devices need to work. You need to have analytics used to build these kind of automatic replenishment models. I need to know early enough that you need a new cartridge in your printer. And maybe you only need the cyan one, but not the, the black or whatever, so we need to automatically, in real time, decide and have a machine at the end deciding uh, with the data we are getting about at which point of time do we need to send um, the single units um, to the customers. For the customer, it's very convenient. We also offer a huge discount. At the end, we are saying, you know, because we believe that you are happier at the end, and we believe that you stay with us longer. So I'm also a user of this. You know, I've never, I've never 
thought about that this is really cool, but at the end, I don't think about in cartridges any longer because it's all happening. I'm just paying something. If I need more or if I need less, you know, the HP has a calculation method. You know, even I'm a heavy user of printing. I have three kids at home. My wife is a teacher. We are all printing like idiots. Well, and I have the high subscription fee, but HP takes care of it. In the months where we are needing more, you know, it's just a little bit more I pay, but usually, you know, I'm okay with my subscription fee. And what we also found out, if people don't worry about the price of the cartridge, but more the price of a page, people start printing more. Because usually, you know, when you think, oh, the cartridge costs 20 bucks or whatever, yeah, so I don't want to pay this, um, you know, but if you just think about it, it's a monthly subscription fee, it works. So what did we do? We changed the supply chain, because usually we bring big pellets or truckloads of ink cartridges to distribution partners, and you go to a retail store to buy it. So we changed the supply chain to a single distribution model. You know, we put all these kind of analytics in place in order to make sure that it's all automatic. And at the end, we have more satisfied customers and a higher consumption. So overall, that's a model which is really booming. Um, and, um, you know, if you have interest, you can afterwards come to me and sign a paper. No, I don't, don't have this with me. Don't worry. <clears throat> but it's a, an example where you change your supply chain flow away from just the standard production and planning or whatever and really think about the customers first. Now let's talk about my second example. How I'm doing about timing. Is it all good still? Yeah, good. So let's talk a bit about 3D. And I start again, you know, with a more conceptual slide, and you will say, hmm, nah, if this is really coming. But we in HP, we believe that 3D printing is changing the manufacturing industry in the next years to come. And why do we believe this? We believe, you know, that you all as supply chain managers will look into your inventory. You all will look into your spare parts and whatever kind of thing. You look at how often do you transport a product from one to another. And people who are running production, they are more conscious about waste. They will look into, you know, what is changing, you know, why do I need to produce it all in China and fly it over to Europe and whatever kind of thing. All these kind of things are going on. And while um, the, the, the big things which are changing, which we normally talk about, robotics and, and, and artificial intelligence, we also believe that 3D, you know, will move to more decentralized production at one point of time. Um, at the end, you are able to do things which you didn't think about before. Let me give you an example. And it's a bit hard to see. This is a box. And in this box, there's something inside. But the box was never open. You cannot tear it apart and open it and put the stuff in. This is printed in one piece. Right? So while you're printing this, on, and you can only do this 3D, you would never be able to do something like this in metal because you cannot bring something inside, you know, which you know, is covered by something outside. That's one example, right? And you say, oh, do you really use it? I have another one for you. So look at this. That's plastic, by the way. It doesn't look like, but it's a chain. I thought supply chain, and have some chains here, so maybe something, at least give some laughters, right? So, but these kind of chains are not open. They are printed together as one piece. Right? And at the end, you know, you have something, you know, which you cannot open. If you do it with metal, you always have these small things, you know, where you can open the metal stuff, you know, this is in once. So, I believe, and there's no waste, right? When you do this, you know, when you do it with metal or whatever kind of thing, how much waste do you generate um, and how heavy it is? So, it is, will be less inventory and it will bring more efficient supply chain. Now, let's go into a real example at HP. So we looked, obviously, you know, where can we use our own 3D printing technology? So if people didn't know, this big box there, right, on the, the, the dark one, so it's our 3D printer, which we offer since a while in the market. It's currently working with plastics, but HP also announced that we are able to do at one point of time metal. Most likely next year we will launch products on metal. But this is a typical example where, you know, we are replacing with a plastic part an aluminum part, and we use this, you know, you see it there, you know, if, if we are putting some holes, you know, in, in, in our um, inkjet um, 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 print bar, you know, you need to extract this kind of stuff, the waste which you created with generating the hole. So we have this aluminum thing, you know, which is going over it and remove the waste. It is 500 grams, you know, it is um, different parts put together, you know, and if you want to create it, it takes some days, right? If you print it, it's only one piece, 
It has the same specs. It can do the same thing. It has only 10% of the weight because it's plastic, right? But you don't need to create it like this. You don't need to think about, you know, how do I put it together and where do I screw or whatever. It's an example, you know, which shows everybody, right? You don't have any waste when you create these kind of, of goods, you know? So um, it is something which is <laughs> clearly, you know, it is far cheaper. It has less weight. And it's something, you know, which we are using in our production environment already now. And obviously, when you are selling a 3D printer, you know, the one question people will ask you, and we have a good answer to this, is, you know, it's nice. You have these kind of machines, right? And this, by the way, is the machine which is printing. Yeah? That's the machine which you need afterwards to remove the powder which you didn't need. And then you can recycle it and use it the next time as well. So we created a printer. Are you using 3D printing technology to create the printer? And the answer to this is, these are all parts which we are using in the printer, which are 3D printed. For sure, our marketing guys love it because they have now a slogan, which is, we have a printer which prints itself. It's not 100% true, as you can see. You know? and we started, you know, we are also supply chain professionals. We did the pieces which make sense in the first run. The interesting thing is, I don't have the slide with me, but you know, we are now looking into the second wave while our engines are getting more productive or whatever, you know, there will be more um, areas you know, where we are able to print um, you know, the machines as well. But if you have something with lower volume, it, I cannot compete you know, with whatever kind of um, um, plastic molding on a high scale supply chain, right? But if you have lower ranges of material you need, you have lower runs, uh, smaller uh, batch cycles, right? Then 3D printing can change the way you, know, um, you are thinking about your material. Um, we are also investigating with our, some of our logistic partners about our own spare parts, you know, which spare parts can we print and don't need to have inventory and warehouses and those kind of things anymore. I know some of in the room are getting a bit nervous about this because it's your business to transport spare parts from the one side of the world to the other. But maybe that's the point of time also to think about for your company, if you're a logistic company, about maybe it's better that we start looking into this as well instead of hoping that my business remains which potentially is going away with a lot of decentral printers. So, message here is, we are also reinventing our supply chain, you know, to use our own uh, production capabilities, um, like the example here is showing, and we find cost reductions and we find, um, you know, less weight in the product. So, in a summary, before I move to Q&A, you know, Patty said, said it at the beginning, the world is changing. Um, and in a changing world, the message I give to my team, what is most important is agility. Today, we still don't know if the Brexit will be hard or weak or whatever kind of thing, but we need to get prepared. We need to start thinking about what are we doing while the world is changing so fast. Um, so while it's changing, we're also changing our supply chain inside out. You know, and I today will not talk about analytics and big data and all these kind of things. But the businesses, you know, become more digital, and this gives also opportunity to reinvent your supply chain. So similar to what I shared with you on the um, Instant Ink. And while um, we are doing all these kind of things, we want to move away from the traditional thinking of supply chain more in the direction of a digital value chain. So with this, I hope these examples, you know, told you that I'm not just talking about some theoretical slides, but that we are doing stuff as well. And I can move over to a Q&A. Thank you. Let me just join you so I can see who's got the questions out there. So um, any immediate questions for Volker that we can see around the room? Well, let me, let me start the ball rolling a bit. Um, you talked a couple of things I want to just, just talk to you about supply chain wise. Um, in your map, you put the control tower at the center. And whilst that's just a graphic, people might say, well, shouldn't we be putting the customer at the center? Because you still had the customer at the side. But you put the control tower at the center. Is that a supply chain man thinking or is that the business thinking? Yeah, so th that's good. You know, it's a, just a graphical illustration. I have another slide where I said it all starts and it ends with a customer, right? Because the customer gives us the order and we are delivering to a customer. But for what, you know, for what I wanted to share today is, you know, we need to stop the thinking of these kind of modules. You know, we have a planning function, we have a procurement function, we have a logistic function or whatever, because 
also, when you change your planning, the logistic team need to know. Because if we, at from one point of time, you know, change the seasonality of our business, we ask people for the Brexit to order earlier UK products or whatever, our logistic team needs to be connected to it. And if you do it sequentially, most likely this information doesn't flow. If you move a control tower in the middle, these kind of information should flow easier. That's the idea behind it. You are right to always spot that I didn't hit the customer first, you know, but uh, <laughs> we still believe that it all starts and ends with the customers. <laughs> Great, okay. Uh, well, until somebody else puts a hand up, I've got another one for you. Um, just going on to the, the 3D printing part. Um, when we first were taught, told about 3D printing, everybody used to say, yes, it's all about R&D, it's development, it's one-offs. And people would talk about, you know, Formula One and how they're using it, and it's one-offs. Now, your language is low runs. How long is that going to be before we're not talking low runs? So, <clears throat> in the 3D, we first need to start showing that our products are working. We need to make sure that these products you know, can deliver these kind of parts regularly, every day, inside out, right? So it's a question about, you know, um, can we make it work for me as us as a company? So R&D, prototyping is the first thing you do because that's easy. You have a new prototype of a new car, or whatever kind of thing, you print it out, the one kind of thing. We strongly believe, you know, that the faster we can go, the faster our machine can go, the more stuff we can create, the more parts we can create, um, you know, the earlier we come into something which you could call small production, low batch sizes. Yeah. We have one company in the world who has bought 24 of our printers, put them all in a big hall, and has it operating 24 hours. So you see that this company is starting to generate more and more parts, right? And we are in discussion with big automotive companies who are also interested in this technology, um, you know, to see where can we use it, you know, to you know, make your car very individual. Maybe you want to have your name printed at one point of time, you know, on the top of your, 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 your car, um, inside, right, um, in plastics. Um, that's something, you know, where the companies are investigating, but you are right. It will take time, and we need to deliver more products which are faster and can, at the end, drive down the cost of each part even more so that at one point of time we can compete with plastic molding as well. Mm. So you see it moving that way. What about the concept that we hear about, about, about 3D printing farms? They're starting to exist. We had UPS yesterday who were talking about them. Um, are they growing fast? I mean, what, what's happening from that point of view? You know, everybody in the industry is a bit careful and skeptic about it, right? It's a new technology which is coming, and with new technology, you know, it's also not working always perfectly at, at day one. It is true that companies like UPS and FedEx also work with HP, and are, some are trying to do it top down and thinking about, I have a strategy, I believe that the world will be different in 10 years, hence I need to invest now. And those are building, you know, the bigger farms to test it out. There are some others who are more careful and say, I really need the business case first. I need to understand, you know, if here's my spare part warehouse, you know, how can I really change this? So we see both sides of, of customers. Actually, I'm with one of our um, logistic partners in two weeks from now, and we will talk about a business case where we, internal HP supply chain, try to help the, the potential customer in the future to get to this business case, to say, these are parts which you potentially can do, these are parts which you today have decentral, which you can, you know, print also decentral, and hence, but you don't have these kind of transport and, and warehousing anymore in the future. So, any questions around? Yeah, two just down here, Daniel. All right, just a, a question. <coughs> On the printing case, on the uh, print subscription, uh, ink subscription uh, case, did you find or did you run into a lot of people challenges changing the model from regular and normal standardized distribution to a subscription model, and uh, or did you create a separate group of people that that generated that model, model, or were you able to to do that with the people that were running the traditional model as well? Good question. So we actually did it with the same organization, but we have built a dedicated team. Um, for sure, also in the past, we from time to time have sent out single cartridges or whatever for emergencies, but we, we built it, created a new supply chain. You know, we created this kind of parcel supply chain out of a central distribution center. We are leveraging the inventory, but the team itself, you know, we created small separate groups who still have separate metrics, but within the broader scheme, because I want to avoid that we are competing at one point of time with each other. It's a customer choice 
If you want to do this, you should get this service. If you don't want to do it and you want to still buy normal cartridges or whatever, you can still do. We see in some countries, and we are also projecting that in some countries, you know, this new model will potentially exceed the old model um, and will be the model, um, but it still takes time and you need to be able, obviously, to also constantly replenish, you know, with a high predictability to um, those kind of customers. And the, do the traditional chains feel threatened, uh, threatened by the new model? Sorry? Do the traditional groups of people in the traditional ways of shipping feel threatened by this new model? So um, I do not see it yet, you know, that the old model will not exist anymore. Um, and from a volume perspective, the old model is still the bigger one. Plus that this is a model with consumers. Yeah? When we talk about big companies, those kind of models are existing already since far longer. It is called managed print services, or it's click on demand, or you, you're just paying the page. You do not pay your cartridges anyhow. So these kind of models do exist and will further develop in Myers in the future. Today, you know, we still need to keep them all different running, and I do not foresee you know, that one model is completely obsoleting the other. No? Makes your supply chain from time to time more complicated. Got, got one just on this next table there. And we'll come back to you, sir, in just yeah. a minute. Good morning. Morning. Uh, my question is about artificial uh, intelligence, which was mentioned on one of your slides. And I'm wondering, what are the use cases for you in, in the day-to-day -day work of your teams of artificial intelligence in your supply chain? Yeah, so I'm not standing here and say we all have, you know, artificial intelligence everywhere. You know, we are still at the beginning. And we start... My view was, you know, you need to start with some practical cases, and before you talk artificial intelligence, you need to start robotics, in my eyes, right? So we have automated some of our, let's make an example, order admin tasks, you know, um, which always needed to be the same. You need to look up if the address is existing, whatever kind of thing. You know, we have started to do, build robots around these kind of things, right? And today, you know, we have about 20 robots, you know, which is easing the life of my customer service representatives who get the orders and get the questions of customers. Now, in order, the next step of, of robotics in my eyes is that these robots should learn themselves about cases. Um, you can call this artificial intelligence, you can call this self-learning robots or whatever, but it goes a bit in this direction. We have, however, here in the room, and I just met him, you know, somebody from IBM, you know, um, who with their Watson machine talk very different language when it comes to artificial intelligence than what I'm currently talking about. We are doing a pilot to find out if we can go further with a company who's offering this service to us to say, think about planning, you know, and we can build you an artificial intelligent engine around this, which at the end propose to your planners which PU do you want to generate, right? But we are in the early stages, we are testing, I want to be honest here, not overselling or whatever. It's something where we want to see. I believe that workforce, the work itself will change through it, but it will be, in my eyes, an evolutionary approach because people also need to get used to it. When we created the first robot, we gave him a name. We call him Billy. He can generate, he can see invoices, yeah, can show invoices and those kind of things. To make people comfortable with the, there is something automatically taking over parts of my job. I don't want this or whatever, but then start giving names, you know, and the, the team is very creative in finding new names on, on it, right? But, you know, it, it at least helps people to come there, right? If you immediately start artificial intelligence, people will be very skeptical. If you go a path and develop an evolution, also hire some people who can work with it, um, you know, then I believe you will be more successful. Okay. And a question right next to the camera, Daniel. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Michael Arner, Sony PlayStation. I want to quickly come back on your control tower. I mean, I think it's absolutely right to put it in the context in the middle of uh, your activities and not the consumer. In a different context, the consumer should be there. Now, my question is, and I want to emphasize everybody to also think about it, at least the shippers here in the room, did you always do it that way? Did you always have a control tower or did you outsource it in the past like we did it and we were thinking about it to maybe this 4PL and all the big 3PLs were telling me since years why I should go to their control towers. So and, and, you know, we decided recently to have our own control tower to create visibility and do the digital transformation of our supply chain. 
Now, there might be more than one answer uh, to the question. Just wonder how you came to that, uh, to that view. So it's a very good question, and if I want to answer it completely, you know, we, we better go out and talk for an hour. But it depends on your company. Those decisions are very critical. Sometimes you do not have these capabilities. And then you look outside, you know, into is there another company who can offer it to us? You know, we are working a lot with system integrators, with those kind of companies who are offering service. And yes, we also, for example, you know, on the logistics side, we also build a control tower which was outsourced. This model, in my eyes, can only work when you have the core competencies in-house because it connects so many different functions. To build this central thing outside of your own company, I, in my eyes, you know, give away too much of the knowledge and the competencies and also what makes your company successful, right? So you need to really balance the, there are areas, you know, where I cannot develop, where it's really a bit outside of my, my, my value add, I can deliver as a supply chain to a company, then you may think about outsourcing, but outsourcing it all makes you also very standard, makes you very similar to your competition, um, and it makes you extremely dependent on the other companies where you go for, right? So you would also not outsource your heart somewhere, right? So if it's in the middle, if it's so important for you that you say you need to build your supply chain around, and yes, the customer is still first, you're right, you know? <laughs> but then, you know, it, if it's so important, then I believe you should not go for complete outsourcing and you don't have control of it anymore. Yeah, fully agree. And, and we decided we need to own the data, especially now everybody talks about big data. You cannot be dependent on the 3PL to then get back your data. Mm -hmm. So you yep. need to own it. Agreed. Thank yeah. you. Great thank question. You. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Volker, thank you very much. It's been a great, great start to the day. Some good food for thought and some practical stuff as well, which is, which is great. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Say so, so thank you to Volker.